Hey everyone, Jared VK3BL here, and today I want to talk about the N connector versus the UHF or PL259 slash SO239 um, combination of connectors. Now, recently on the ham radio um, group on Facebook, there was a thread started saying, why don't we do away with the, um, the PL259 slash SO239? I'm going to refer to them as the UHF connectors from now on um, and replace it with a much more modern N connector. Um, in my left hand is the N male, in my right hand is the N female. Um, there you can get versions now that are rated to um, up to a gig, 11 gigahertz. Um, they go together quite nicely. They're allegedly more waterproof. Um, well, I think, believe they are more waterproof because there's a gasket on the inside there which presses against that. Um, so, you know, all around people saying, well, why don't we, you know, ditch this antique connector? And the funny thing was they said, oh, the, we should upgrade, you know, the really, really old um, UHF connector that, um, that was made in the 1930s. Let's upgrade to something more modern like the end connector. Well, the end connector was made in the 1940s, so it's not particularly much newer. Um, now, the main reason people are asking to change is there's a flaw, I suppose, with the design of the UHF connector in that it's not constant impedance, and it particularly becomes a problem above about 300 megahertz. It starts wobbling around, I suppose, and it stops becoming a 50 ohm connector and goes up and down a little bit, and basically, can cause issues if it's in the wrong place of your, um, your I guess, transmitter system. So people were saying, well, you know, let's, let's ditch it. Why don't we go to the constant impedance and we'll never have to think about these things again. Let's move on. You know, this connector has had its time, virtual throw away here. Let's ditch it. Well, there's a few good reasons to, to stay with the PL259 and, and SO239. Now, a lot of people say it's because they're easy to assemble. Now, personally, I don't think they're any easier to assemble than an end connector. I think it's a much of a muchness, especially depending on the type of connectors you buy. I like to buy crimp, uh, Total Crimp PL259s, and they are really, really easy to assemble. Um, uh, end connectors, especially the clamp type. Sorry, do, do I have a clamp type one here? Yep, that's a clamp type. I find them more fidgety than my crimp PL259s. So I don't think assembly is why they've stuck around. Another, a lot of people say maybe it's because they're more commonplace. Now, once again, I don't think that's why they've stuck around. I mean, in, you know, um, Collins used to have what, what they call now the RCA connector um, on, their, on their exciters that then plugged into their amplifiers, you know, the, the round ones you see on stereos. And that obviously has been done away with now. So. I don't think change is, is that big of a problem in amateur radio. I don't think that's insurmountable. So I don't think that's the reason we're still using PL259s either. Um, and the reason I do think we're using them is because they offer one very significant advantage over the end connector, and that's their ability to handle one, higher voltages, and two, higher currents. Now, this isn't something you'll find on a spec sheet. Most spec sheets, and I'm referring to the Amphenol ones here, will say something like the PL259 slash UHF series is rated at 500 volts, and the N series is rated at 1500 volts with 2500 volts as the maximum peak power. And so you look at that and you think, well, what is Jared talking about? Why is he saying that the PL259 or UHF connector is rated can withstand higher voltages and higher currents. And I'll explain that really quick, um, briefly and simply here. If we look at, oh, sorry, an SO239, the, the voltage breakdown is defined by the distance between the inner conductor and the outer shield or outer conductor. That's true for all coaxial connectors and cables. In this case, the distance, and excuse my um, much much used tool bag, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, calipers, um, we've got about three millimetres between the outside and the centre, and that's just over um, one hundredth of an inch. Now the end connector is a lot harder to measure because you actually, 
you actually need the female pin, that's the female pin, um, inserted because the male pin, as I'm not sure whether you can see there, but anyone who's seen one before, the male pin is actually neck down so that the female could fit in. So to measure this, we have to put the a female pin in place and then we'll measure the distance. Now, it's a very tricky sort of thing to do, but in the past, um, I've sort of agreed upon the distance is about 1.5 millimetres. So from that, and it's pretty easy to see with the eye, you've actually got twice the distance between the centre conductor and the outer conductor on a UHF or SO239 than you do on the equivalent end connector. Now, that means basically you've got twice the voltage handling, um, especially in air, the, um, the breakdown in air is about three kilovolt, uh, three kilovolts per millimeter in ideal conditions. So, assuming um, assuming this, well, the end connector is an air dielectric, um, as you can see there. Um, the voltage handling of that, um, assuming ideal air, is going to be about four point um, five kilovolts. The voltage handling of this is going to be roughly nine kilovolts. So, one, there you go. That's one thing that sort of works in favour of the um, SO239 or the UHF series is it's got twice the voltage breakdown capacity. And that's a good thing and I'll explain why in a minute. Now secondary, they have higher current handling abilities and in a connector the current handling is generally speaking, well, is essentially defined by the diameter of the centre pin. In the case of the PL259 the centre pin is roughly, and let's get this right, one, two, three, four, well, one, two, three, four, and it's about pretty much four millimetres in diameter. Um, so, you know, you've got a four millimetre connector there, uh, centre pin there. Now on the N, on the other hand, let's have a look, and we're going to measure from not quite the, the, the first part, but a little bit lower, um, because that obviously spreads out when the male pin goes in, so we'll measure from just here. On the N we've got 3 millimetres, we're just under 3. So basically you've got 25% or no, 33% more current handling as a minimum. I don't even know if that formula is correct, but it is 33% larger um, in terms of circumference or a diameter, sorry, than the end connector. So there you go. The PL259 and SO239, as you can see, it does when inserted, it is pretty much, an, oh, I'm missing a bit there. Let's uh, where's my other bit. When inserted, you do have a bit of an air gap there. Um, you know, so you've got higher current handling and higher breakdown voltage. Now, why does this matter? Well, on two metres and above, we generally use resonant antennas. So they're tuned to our 50 ohm, ohm system. And if you do the maths, it doesn't really matter how much power you put through it. You're not going to reach the voltage um, breakdown of an end connector or really the current handling capacity because you're using resonant antennas. But on HF, especially if you're using an external tuner, a lot of us do end up reaching pretty high voltages. Anyone who's owned an, owned an external tuner and say tried to, tried to tune up their 40 metre dipole on 80 metres or worse, will have heard maybe, if, if, if it uses, um, if it's a, a manual tuner with capacitors, they will have heard the capacitors arc over from time to time and basically they would, will have had to turn down um, the power applied to the tuner if they can get if they can get it to tune at all um, on a band it's way too electrically short for. And why is that? That's because electrically short antennas um, are very reactive and end up producing very, very high voltages. And in a nutshell, when you're playing around on HF, you're more likely to end up with reactive antennas. For instance, on the 80 meter band, um, it's so so wide between 
um, at 3,500 um, kilohertz and 4,000 kilohertz, that you can't have a resonant antenna across the whole band. You do have to tune it or optimize your antenna for one part of the band. And that's not even talking about compromised antennas such as the G5RV or the ZS6 BKW. So basically on HF, you are going to encounter antennas that you know um, are reactive. And in my opinion, and I suspect maybe the unspoken wisdom of many manufacturers, the higher voltage um, handling and the higher current handling of the PL259 slash SO239 combination really wins out on HF. So that's one thing I'll say um, in favor of the, of the UHF series. It, it is a much better connector when you're using lower frequencies um, where it is basically a constant impedance and when you're going to encounter reactive loads because it you know, it's not going to be the first thing dark over in your system. And let's face it, you don't want your connectors flashing over first. You know, you'd probably rather hear the sizzle of your um, your tuning capacitors in your antenna tuner um, than potentially the silent sizzling of your PL259 somewhere in your feed line. Now, I will go on and say one other thing in de defense of the PL259s. When they use, say, on 70 centimetres, at the source, which is in this case your radio, where you'll have, um, you know, the female. And when they're used at the load, um, where, you know, in this case the antenna, where once again you'll have the female, and there's just straight coaxial cable in between, you're not likely to notice any impedance problems. And that's because the manufacturer will have tuned the radio or the source for any um, impedance mismatch issues in the connector. Likewise, the manufacturer of the antenna will have tuned the antenna for any mismatches in the connector. So all, all the studies that have been done showing the non-linearities and the impedance bumps, I guess, in the SO239s, they haven't been done in the real world where you've got the connector at your source and you've got the connector at your load and nothing in between. They've all been done where the connector is used in the middle of your feed line. And what people have done, they've got like a variable network analyzer. Let's pretend my signal generator is a VNA for a second. They've got a short cable coming off the VNA. They've got it going into the connector. Then they've got another cable going off the PL259. Often they've even got so much as a three inch barrel in the middle. And they'll have that going back into the second port of the VNA. And yes, of course, they notice that there's an impedance um, mismatch and reflections and a bump and whatnot in that connector arrangement because it's in the middle of the transmission line and nothing has been done to, I guess, counter um, the impedance mismatch. That's a completely different situation from having your SO239 at your transceiver and at your antenna. So, well, that's a bit high there, but at your antenna. So. I guess what I'm trying to say is, for ham radio usage, this is a good connector. It's got roughly twice the voltage breakdown of an end connector. It's got a higher current handling capacity. It's great for HF. It's still fine for two meters. I mean, it is rated up to, to 300 megahertz officially. And even on UHF, so long as you don't use them in the, in the middle of your transmission line, your equipment manufacturer has probably counted for any discon discontinuities. So I have no problem with this connector. I don't see there being a need for a replacement. And if I was gonna replace it, it certainly wouldn't be with an end connector. Now I have actually had the trouble of placing an end connector in my feed line at the wrong place where there's a, um, a node and a voltage maximum. And I've actually arced these guys over. Um, the, the truth of the matter is when you're playing around with HF, End connectors are not your friend. Stick with the UHF series, the SO239 and PL259, and just, you know, be happy. Um, I heard a, heard a mind-boggling story about a ham who went and replaced um, on his amplifier all of, all of the outputs with N females. Now, I can't think of anything worse to do, you know? Um, here you are maybe with a legal limit amplifier and you're going to place a connector with half the voltage breakdown of a PL259 
and it's HF, so there's no advantage to doing so in terms of impedance. That's just nuts. Um, so hopefully this sheds a bit of light on the PL259 versus N connector war. Now, what I will say is if we do want to get rid of this 80 year old conductor, uh, connector, sorry, let's not do it in favor of a 70 year old one, especially a lower power 70 year old one, despite what any spec sheet says. Let's do it for something that is genuinely higher power, such as, um, and probably the most common one is a 716 thin. That is a huge connector. It's probably too big for our, our use, but on the back of amplifiers, it would be, be it would be beautiful. Um, but uh, I believe there's a connector called the uh, the 4.310, which is a relatively new connector. I think it was made in the in the 2000s. And while there isn't many options for the type of coax we use at the moment, if we got behind it, um, it's of equivalent size, just slightly bigger than a PL259. If we got behind that connector, I'm sure we could get people making RG213 and LL400 um, versions of it. Um, that's the four, I think it's the 4.3-10 connector. Um, otherwise, if you really, really are keen to go for a connector that handles higher power than the PL259, your best option is a 716 thin, which you can get from anything from RG58 all the way up to, you know, um, 7, 7 8s heliacs and stuff like that. So, anyway. I'll wind it up, guys, if that was a little longer than I thought it would be, but hopefully I've explained why it makes a heck of a lot of sense to stick with the UHF or PL259 slash SO239 connectors on HF, especially on the back of your, line of your legal limit linear amplifier. 73, this is Jared, VK3BL, for Rate My Radio.